It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. This episode is brought to you by Beyond Natural Pet Food. Beyond Pet Food helps me care for what matters, my pets and my world. They help me nourish my pets with high-quality natural ingredients like wild-caught salmon and organic free-range chicken. Beyond also has responsible sourcing practices and a long-term partnership with the Nature Conservancy. Beyond Pet Food, your pet, your world. Learn more at beyondpetfood.com. If you hear this message, please listen. There exists a dark organization who research nightmarish creatures, objects, and entities. For decades, they've been using you, the unsuspecting public, as test subjects. They are known, they are known as Red 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 Bureau. Red Bureau. My name is Agent Conroy, and I used to work for them. But now, I'm on the run. I'm leaking their highly classified, classified reports, reports because, because I believe you have a right to know. When you no longer hear my broadcasts, it means they've found me. Zero, 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 007 Midas. Midas On the outskirts of town in a large empty house lived a man that watched the years drop by in the world around him as he continued living his heart became hardened and he refused to believe that good could survive in this world Lisa Cunningham is the latest victim in a world gone bad a world under the influence of the bureau whether through science or the supernatural, the Bureau continues to keep reports of the strange goings-on in the world around us. Report 0007, entitled Midas, details an incident between Lisa Cunningham and Amos of the Amos Estate. Originally filed under medical occurrences, the report has moved between various departments as the Bureau has attempted to discover what the origin of the incident was and how the events of the incident were able to take place. As the late Miss Cunningham discovered, her heart may have been too open to helping others. It seems Mr. Amos was aware of this as well, and though some may consider his measure extreme, there is little doubt that in his mind, he was acting under the desire, under to, the protect. desire to protect. As long as love motivates every decision you make, you can't go wrong. I don't mean the romantic kind of love that leaves you constantly worrying about if you shared too much or if you sent one too many texts over the course of the day. I'm talking about the love that humanity is supposed to have for each other. The love you might feel when you see someone suffering on the streets. The kind of love that is spread among those who don't know each other, but no, we can't make it on our own. The kind of love that is stronger than oak, stronger than stone. With this love, if you let it lead your life, you can't go wrong. You shouldn't confuse that with an ability to never be hurt, however. Love is making yourself vulnerable, and that's the scariest part. If you don't know someone, how can you trust them? And if you can't trust them, how can you be vulnerable enough to let yourself try to love them? It's a struggle I face on a constant basis. Every time I meet with a patient, I'm able to emphasize with them instantly. But empathy is not the same as love. The great thing about hospice is being there for those who can't be there for themselves. But it wears on you. Facing death so often, walking people through it and navigating it for yourself. Each time you face it, a part of you hardens. I decided to take a break from hospice before I completely petrified myself. Assisted living isn't as bad, thankfully. Some of it is just being a glorified janitor or maid. I don't mind cleaning, and a lot of people who need the help can't keep everything clean themselves. Or they have too much. Like Mr. Amos. 
His place is the biggest I've seen yet. I reach his front door, a set of large double mahogany slabs, and look for a doorbell or camera, but there's nothing there. I grasp the knocker and slam it against the door a few times. I'm about to repeat it when I hear the faintest of squeaking come from the other side of the door. The door swings open and standing directly behind it is Mr. Amos, his gloved hands resting in his lap. I guess he's sitting though, not standing. He rolls forward in his wheelchair, and the wheels continue to squeak against the floor. I guess that's what the sound was. Lisa, he says, not really a question, more a matter of fact. Please don't be a dick. Please don't be a dick. I smile and place my hand out for a shake. That's me, I say. He keeps his gloved hands to himself. You're late, he says. Damn, he's going to be a dick, isn't he? Yes, I apologize for that, Mr. Amos. The bus was running late and... You take the bus, he asks, almost scoffing. Yes, I say. His eyes narrow. You need to get a car. Well, we aren't all giant mansion on the outskirts of town, Rich. Part of making sure love motivates every action you take is to make sure you love yourself. And that means not letting people walk all over you. His eyes widen a bit at that remark. Touché, he says. And, well, that appears to be it. I can see his stature soften. He backs his chair up and gestures to the large foyer beyond the door. Come on in. This place is huge. My dumb poor self can only think of comparing it to something like a bank, but not just any bank, like the headquarters of the bank downtown that you go to, where no one at your local branch can help you. I know, I have a way with words. My surprise has to be obvious on my face. Mr. Amos stares at me for a second and smiles. Nicest patient house you've been to? Definitely one of them, I reply. He knows I'm impressed, so I just sink into it, turning my head up and looking around. A large chandelier hangs in the center of the ceiling with, no shit, actual candles on it. I guess that's why it's a little stuffy in here. A large spiraling stairway leads to a second and third floor above us with an electric track along the stair wall for Mr. Amos' chair. There are paintings every few feet on the wall. These things look old. Actually, they're the only thing in the house. Mansion, sorry. They're the only thing in the mansion that aren't in perfect condition. It's not that they're dust-covered or anything, but they're old and faded, obvious antiques. Most of them are of strangers, But the one at the very bottom is of what looks to be a younger Amos. His hair not quite as grey as it is now, and his cheeks way less sunken into his face. He still holds that same not smile, which is mainly how I'm able to tell it's him. But this picture looks way older than what he has to be. I think his record said he was 84. I guess he just hasn't taken care of the painting but everything else in this house is immaculate. Behind the stairs is a hallway that stretches on for quite some time. I can see statues lining the walls for the entire hall. God, I hope this guy doesn't collect suits of armor. Mr. Amos pulls up behind me, looking at me as I look at his estate. This way, he says and proceeds down the hallway. I follow closely behind and I'm finally able to see the statues in full. They aren't suits of armor or anything like that, just actual stone statues of various kinds. Most are women, but there are some men and even a few children. Most of them look like antiques, sculpted long ago from people of a different time. Others look newer, like they were just done over the last few decades. I can't help but ask, you're a collector of sorts, Mr. Amos. He chuckles. (laughs) <laughs> Please, just Amos will be fine. And to answer your question, absolutely. Just Amos? He only wants to go by his last name? So, what are you collecting? I ask. People. He says. 
One of the statues is of a young boy, his hand outstretched, waiting for something. What exactly does that mean? I ask. We continue down the hallway as he talks. Humanity has always inspired me. The leaps of progress we've continued to make over the past few centuries. Things refuse to slow down for us. Instead, they increase in speed. A printing press, antiseptics, the automobile, flights, computers. We continue to fly along at faster and faster speeds. And these people remind you of that? I ask. Are these statues of some of the people that helped humanity come this far? What do you think? He replies. I have no idea who invented antiseptics, so I wouldn't be able to recognize them if they are here, I say. Joseph Lister, and no, he's not here. Learn something new every day, I mumble to myself. We round the corner at the end of the hall and come to a large open room. Books line the walls and bookshelves and a fire roars in the fireplace across from the entrance hall. I don't know why a fire is going on in the middle of summer, but here we are. I guess if you have a fireplace, you look for any excuse to use it. And older people tend to get colder more easily. Be a lamb and put another log on the fire, he orders. I cross the room and toss a log on the blaze. It roars for a second and settles into the new piece of fuel. Have a seat, Mrs. Cunningham. I take a seat across the coffee table. It's Miss, actually, I correct. Uh, An old spinster, eh? He says while smiling a crooked toothy smile. Not quite the old part, Amos, and Lisa will do fine. I really can't get a read on this guy. Usually I'm pretty good at picking up the way my patients will act around me. A lot of them like to be smart asses, and honestly like it when you're a smart ass back. Amos seems to be one of those. But he's got this layer of superiority to him. It's like, he thinks he's better. He knows he's better. And he doesn't mind being called out on it much, because he knows it won't change anything. It's a level of confidence I haven't really seen in others of his age. Amos reaches for a teapot on the table and gestures for a cup. Oh, sure, thanks, I say. He removes the gloves from his hands and pours two cups of steaming hot tea. He places a cup on a saucer and pushes it my way, then sets the pot down and drinks from his own cup. The brown liquid smells faintly of lavender and honey. I take a sip, probably one of the best cups of tea I've ever had. So, he begins. How long have you been a nurse? About 15 years, I answer. He pulls out a notepad and scribbles quickly on the pages. What's that? I ask. I like to get to know my caretakers, he replies. I nod and take another sip of my tea. I've had patients do weirder stuff, so it doesn't really faze me. But notes written down in a tiny notebook is still a first. The agency really should have sent you my file, I say. This is more personal. He responds without looking up from his notepad. What about family? He asks. What about it? I respond. Do you have any? I don't really share that information with my patients, I say. So no. He says. You can take that however you like, I state, then let it drop. He's writing down a lot for a simple no. Are you originally from here? He asks. I grew up in Santa Monica, so about an hour from here. But I've been here quite often throughout my life. Had family that stayed here. Had. Past tense. So, no longer with us? He asks. Just not here anymore, I say. He goes on for a bit, asking random questions, some too personal, and some really broad. I answer the ones I want, and he doesn't push on any of the other ones. He's finally done about an hour later, so I get to my questions. Warning, signal interruption detected. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. 
I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate, complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat, eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. This episode is brought to you by Beyond Natural Pet Food. Beyond Pet Food helps me care for what matters, my pets, and my world. They help me nourish my pets with high-quality natural ingredients, like wild-caught salmon and organic free-range chicken. Beyond also has responsible sourcing practices and a long-term partnership with the Nature Conservancy. Beyond Pet Food, your pet, your world. Learn more at beyondpetfood.com. Oh, it's such a clutch pickup, Dave. I was worried we'd bring back the same team. I meant those blackout motorized shades. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. I installed these and then got some for my mom, too. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Hall of Fame son? They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Blinds.com is the GOAT. The GOAT. Go to Blinds.com for up to 45% off. Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. You seem pretty capable, Amos. So what exactly do you need my help for? He nods along with my question. Just the usual chores around the house. Cooking, cleaning, errands. Why do you need a nurse for that? Why not just a standard maid? Because a maid only does those things. If anything happens, I'd like whoever is already here to be able to do something other than call an ambulance. He replies, that's fair. It's a good point. I get it. So is there anything immediate I can help you with today? Yes, the office in the hallway. It's been a while since it has been cleaned. The desk in particular could use a good dusting. Sounds good. I'll get right on that. I get up from the table before realizing I have no idea where anything is. Amos can see this on my face. Everything you need will be in the closet in the kitchen, behind the glass door, there. He points behind me. I turn around and head through the door. The kitchen is, well, just as nice as everything else I've seen in the house. Fresh fruit sits on a bowl in the center island. Various bronze pots and pans hang from hooks on the ceiling. Cleaning supplies are right where he said they'd be, inside the closet. Part of me is a little offended. I'm a registered nurse and I'm being treated like a janitor right now, which isn't to say janitors are lowly or anything, Society would fall apart without them, and they're super underappreciated, but this isn't what I signed up to do. But it doesn't matter. I still get paid, and he's apparently a client that pays very well. So it's more that the agency will get paid, and the more I will get paid. I grab the supplies and head down the hallway. The statues stare at me as I stare at them. Their eyes seem to follow me, like those weird pictures in abandoned haunted houses. The child statue seems to really stand out. The boy reaching out for something. I look at the base of the statue and there's a nameplate. Robert Williamson, 1890 to 1901. Oh, it's a memorial thing. I wonder who it was then. Maybe a family member. That sucks he only had 11 years of life. I'm even more sad now that I know this statue is based on what was once a living person. I move on before I'm able to get too sad. The next statue says, Teresa Amos, 1821 to 1846. Weird. His first name is her last name. Maybe an older family member. The woman stands with a flowing robe. A shocked look on her face. The details of her robe are exquisite. 
Stonework has always impressed me, but this is on another level. I remember back in college, studying art from centuries ago. There was one marble statue by Michelangelo, of Moses, I think. On the statue, Moses is sitting down with something in his lap and his arm on top of it. He has his pinky raised a bit, and further down his arm, you can see a very small muscle standing up on the back of his forearm. Our professor informed us that this tiny muscle only stood out when the pinky was raised, meaning Michelangelo put so much detail into his sculptures that he caught one muscle that only stands out in one specific circumstance, and he got it right. All that to say, Michael doesn't have shit on whoever did this. The robe looks like it could ripple right before my eyes. The hair on her head falls in strands over her shoulder. It actually looks like a piece was broken off at one point. I guess something that has been around for that long can't stay perfect forever. I could stand in this hallway staring at these statues for hours, but I eventually find the door to the office and head in. Once again, immaculate is a word I could use to describe this whole place. I'm not even sure what he wants me to clean in here. He said the desk, but it's spotless. Well, okay. As I get closer, I can tell it's not exactly spotless. There are papers scattered across it, and an ink stain on the surface of the wood. That's what this whole place is, though. Surface level prestige with tiny imperfections. The closer you look, almost like a rock looks solid. When you stare at it, but the closer you look, the more pores you can see within it. There are little cracks and floors spread throughout the house. I move some of the papers off the desk and place them in a nearby folder. It looks like a lot of the paperwork was from the agency. Physical copies I'm sure he wants to hang on to. I place all of those papers in one specific folder, then work on moving others. The rest are a combination of science research papers and newspaper clippings. Amos must love his history. The newspapers go back decades. He even has a newspaper from the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I place that one in its own folder. The science papers tend to be mostly about plant research, some stuff down in Florida in the Everglades. I'll never understand how people live down there with alligators in their backyards. There's other papers on, oh no, cryptozoology? I stifle a laugh. I guess when you're rich, real life can get boring. So you have to look into the fun fake stuff. There's a report number and a title. Mimic. Looks like something was taking the shape of others and killing people? Okay. I gather up all the science papers and place them in a separate folder. You can at least see most of the desktop now. I pull open a drawer to put the folders in and it falls out of the desk. Its contents spilling onto the nearby rug. Thankfully, the rug cushioned the fall, so I don't think Amos heard anything. I pick everything back up and see that a small leather bound book fell open. When it fell out, a date stands out on one of the pages. February 27th, 1846. I almost felt bad reading it, but it's obviously not a journal since it's that old. Must be notes on some of the material Amos is studying. I read the February 27th entry. It was a cold morning. The day began slowly, but the sun I hastened across, across the, the sky, sky as I waited, waited to meet with Teresa. Teresa. Arrangements were made to have tea in the garden. I know this is the area she admires most. That is why I chose it. I wanted her to be as comfortable as possible. Her last memory should have been one of happiness. She came just after sunset, when the night's air began to cool. Due to the weather, she wore my favorite piece of clothing. A maroon silk robe. I am glad she wore this. She should not only be happy, but comfortable. The process was quick. Quicker than usual. I think it may have been the closeness that caused this. I have not had any issue affecting others with the petrification, but... Teresa... I attempted to avoid it for so long, but there was no one else. I was alone. I was fading. I needed someone new. 
We drank, we laughed, she tucked her hair behind her ears. I smiled, though I knew it was coming. She said she wished to give me a kiss. I've always appreciated the forthrightness Teresa spoke with, being that it would be her final day. I obliged. I removed my gloves and planted a kiss upon her lips. I could feel her smile, but the smile turned to a gasp as I cupped her head in my bare hand. Her flesh turned to stone. Her hair stiffened before my eyes. Her body ceased to move as her eyes stared into my soul. Her last breath was wasted, saying my name. Amos. Finding everything okay? I hear Amos ask behind me. I was too engrossed in the writing to realize he had come into the room. I turn and drop the book. His eyes never leave mine. Read anything interesting? He asks. I shake my head. I didn't see anything. The book just fell out as I was cleaning. He wheels over to me, coming behind the desk. It's not the first time that blasted thing has wormed its way into someone's hands. Amos reaches out for the book. I kneel down and pick it up, then give it to him. He flips open to the exact spot I was reading. <sighs> I do miss Teresa. He sighs. How? I ask. How did you know her? I've been around for quite some time. He smiles. No, really, what is this? Some sort of prank you like to play on new people? Unfortunately not. He says. Teresa, much like Robert and Cassandra and Cooper and Miles and all of the others, paid a dear price for me. One that I will never forget and will continue to honor them by having them stay here with me. I back up slowly, trying to squeeze around the desk. Listen, I think I should be leaving now. He turns his wheelchair to the other side. Should you leave? Yes. Will you leave? Now. I'm sorry? This is more of a permanent position here. Amos wheels toward me, but I hop over the desk and make a run for it. Get back here! He yells after me. I turn down the hall and sprint to the front doors. I can hear his wheels squeaking on the floor as he gives chase. I reach the front doors, but they're locked tight. I reach for a lock that isn't there. There's no doorknob, no deadbolt, no lock of any kind that seems to keep this door closed. I turn back around and see Amos quickly coming down the hallway. He stops in the foyer and removes his gloves. It will all be over soon, he says. I turn and run to the stairs, jumping up and taking them two at a time. When I reach the top, I can see a hallway that veers to the left and the right. In the foyer below, Amos makes his way to the chairlift and follows me upstairs. I run down the hall to the left and find a room to hide in. The air in the room is stale and dust floats within a shaft of sunlight that streaks through a nearby window. I run across the room to hide behind one of the window curtains and trip over something in the dark. Finally, my eyes adjust and that's when I see it. More statues, only these are broken and scattered throughout the room. What I tripped over looks to be a head, but not a human head. A dog head, made of stone. Further on the floor behind it is the rest of its body. Looking around the room confirms that everything in here is a statue, but they're all damaged. Arms and legs lay in scatters on tables and chairs. A head is on one spot, a foot in another. I try to get up, but the door opens and I freeze in place. Amos wheels in, staring right at me. I'm very sorry you had to be the victim here, Lisa. I scamper back a few feet. What do you want? Please just tell me and I'm sure I can get it. It's not what I want, my darling. It is what I need. You happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're a caring individual. I can see it. Just like her, Teresa. I can feel myself begin to cry, but not because I'm scared or sad. I'm angry. Who do you think you are? You don't know me. I do not, but I know you're kind, the thoughtful type, the caretakers, the ones who love through action. You are a rare breed and deserve to be treasured and preserved. That is something I can offer. I don't want any bullshit you can offer. I want to leave. I stand up and attempt to make my way by him, but he grabs my arm 
and an ice cold feeling shoots through my veins. His hand feels like a cold steel tool wrapping around my skin. The cold spreads throughout my body. I can feel it working its way into my chest, my limbs, behind my eyes. I look down and see my body turning to stone. Marble spreads over my skin, making it that much whiter than it already was. My clothes freeze midair. The breath out of my mouth turns to mist. My legs won't move. I go to scream, and the sound of rocks sliding against each other erupts from my mouth. I can't move, can't speak, can't breathe. I can only see and hear. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Amos says softly. But you are in good hands. Trust me. We'll have you join the others shortly. Missing persons report was finally issued for Lisa Cunningham. Her likeness was found in the form of a statue on Mr. Amos's estate. Once wind of this irregular case became known by the Bureau, a team of agents were sent down to cover the case. Amos, along with 17 marble statues dating back to the 1400s, were taken into custody, and his estate was destroyed by the Bureau in a controlled demolition. It seems that Amos holds the ability to turn flesh to stone by a single touch. Upon his arrest at his home, it was reported that he removed a pair of gloves and turned three agents to stone, much like the marble statues found in his home. Tests have placed the age of Mr. Amos in the hundreds, and Mr. Amos has explained his history to multiple agents, claiming to have lived for centuries and to be immortal. When asked about the statues, Amos simply stated that he has watched the world turn more and more evil at the start of every new century, and his goal was to protect those too good for this world. It is now theorized that Mr. Amos was working on his own collection of people to begin some sort of community with, Though Mr. Amos has not yet proven he holds the ability to return a marble statue back to flesh, he has made this claim, and therefore the theory is the leading theory among the Bureau. Naturally, the Bureau is now studying this ability, hoping to gain control of it for themselves. In the study of this ability, the Bureau has dismantled multiple marble statues for study, hoping to discover more of the nature of this curse. Upon the disassembly of the statues, they appear to be 100% marble stone, made of no other materials. No leftover human parts remain once a subject is turned to a statue. The Bureau have currently affixed a pair of locked gloves onto the hands of Mr. Amos as they continue to study the phenomenon. I'm Josh Tomar, host of Redwood Bureau. Thank you for listening. Redwood Bureau is a horror fiction podcast and part of the EerieCast podcast network. For more dreadful terrors, follow Redwood Bureau on Spotify and iTunes, and check out our other podcasts like Unexplained Encounters and Freaky Folklore on your favorite podcast platform. You can find me on Twitter and Twitch under username Tomamoto, T-O-M-A-M-O-T-O, and my voiceover is featured in a wide variety of your favorite video games, anime, and other animated shows. Until next time, don't forget, this world is a strange one. Strange one.